All right. So yeah, Matthew chapter 10, in verse 34. This is one of the most misquoted passages. I say that a lot. It's probably not. But it is a very divisive scripture. I should stand closer to the mic. In verse 34, it says, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Oh, boy. Now, I have heard so many sermons where the preacher tells you, now see, this is why you have to love Jesus and love God more than your family, more than anyone, and give everything you have to the church. Because it says so right here, doesn't it? I don't think that's what Jesus is trying to tell us. And to get an idea, a little bit of context in order. Now, my first thought was when he says, I didn't come to bring peace but a sword. I first wanted to turn to Ephesians and read Paul when he's talking about the armor of God and the sword represents the truth. But that would be putting Paul's words in Jesus' mouth. I like the image. I like the image that when we live our truth, when we are fully ourselves, the self that God created us to be, that that doesn't let us fit in with the people around us anymore. And especially our families. As gay people, we all know that our families don't always approve when we, when we first come out. And I could certainly empathize there with the idea that Jesus, in bringing us to truth, to the spirit of truth, to the love of God, to the image that God created us to be, that that doesn't bring us peace in the short term. But in the long term, there's no better way to be at peace than to be true to yourself. But once again, I'm putting Paul's words in Jesus's mouth. So how about a little context? Jesus had just been approached by the Pharisees and they said to him, now, these miracles you're doing, you're doing them by the power of the devil. It's by Beelzebul's power that you're casting out these demons. And Jesus says, you silly Pharisees, why would the devil cast out demons? It doesn't make any sense. But the Pharisees are against him and they're against his followers. And they know that those Pharisees have significant political power. They're going to cause trouble. So in verse... 24, Jesus says to his disciples, the student is not above the teacher, nor the servant above his master. If the head of a house has been called Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household? In other words, if they're coming for me, they're going to come for you too. Because if you're following in my way and they hate me, they're going to hate you too. In verse 28, he says, But don't be afraid of those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Instead, be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul. <sighs> Thanks, Jesus. That's reassuring. <sighs> don't be afraid of the people who are coming to murder you. Be afraid of God, because he can send you to hell. Jesus has quite the sense of humor. <sighs> verse 29 he shows us a bit more of that sense of humor. He says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You're, more th you're worth more than a whole lot of birds. <sighs> Jeez, I've always wanted to know out of the mouth of Jesus how much I'm w worth in quantifiable terms such as cheap meat. <laughs> but that's what he's trying to tell us. God takes care of these little birds 
and they're sold in the market as cheap meat. Don't worry, you're worth a whole lot more than cheap meat. God values us, and this is what he's trying to tell us. In verse 32, he says, Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. In other words, that love your neighbor thing that he's been talking about, love your neighbor as yourself, this is Jesus living it. Do you love me? I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. Do you not love me? I don't know you either. In verse, and I like to pair this with verse 40. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. And now we get one of the broadest um, ideas, the broadest formulations of salvation that we'll find in Scripture. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. In other words, you don't have to know the name of Jesus. You don't have to know that Jesus is God, is the one and only God of the universe. If you can so much as recognize that his disciples are doing good in the world, and you take in someone who's doing good, that's doing the work of Jesus in the world. You just don't know it. That's right. As, as they say, you may have been entertaining angels. And I don't know how far this broad definition goes, but I know this, if you welcome that prophet, if you welcome that righteous person, if you give a disciple of Christ that cup of cold water, then you're doing the work of the gospel. Everyone who supports the church and everyone who supports those in need is doing that work. So that's why Jesus says, if anyone loves their father or mother more than me, they're not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. If we've given our entire life to God in this way, then of course, when people recognize that our lives are dedicated to God, then God rewards them for even taking that one step. Remember that Jesus said, seek and you will find. Ask and the door will be open. Ask and it will be, I guess I don't remember. Knock and the door will be open to you. Ask and it shall be given unto you. I think the bar is very low in terms of what is salvation. But God values us very highly. He's trying to reach out to each and every one of us, all the, li the little sparrows, even the ones he can't make change for. So do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Jesus is dividing people. There are those who are going to recognize him and those that won't. There are those who may see us in the world, us Christians who have dedicated our lives to God, and they're going to see one of two things. This is a righteous person. This is a prophet. This is just someone who needs a cup of cold water. They may see that in us, or this is the son of the devil. And it's going to divide them on that line. Can you think of Christians that you think, oh, that, that there, that's the son of the devil. 
I think that we can look to other churches, other people's belief systems, see that they're not supporting those in need. They're not supporting those who are righteous or those who are seeking God and say, well, that's the son of the devil right there. We can demonize them because the word of truth divides us. But Jesus' answer isn't the truth. It isn't we have to do the right things and believe all the right things. You notice in this whole passage, there's not one thing about theology. The only thing he talks about is receiving people or turning them away. He talks about righteousness and unrighteousness, but in vague terms. And he gives us the question, what are you willing to give for the gospel? What are you willing to give because God loves you? If you're so much as willing to acknowledge Jesus before others, that's enough. If you're just willing to help someone because they need help, that's still enough. I know you're probably expecting doom and gloom from this passage, but I don't have it. Because even though it promises us that we won't have peace for doing the right thing, it does promise us that God will take care of each and every one of us. And that if we can't, hold to that gospel, even if we can't, even if we can't hold up to our end of the bargain, helping those in need, we know at least one thing about God, that he grieves for each and every one that falls away. That's how much God values us. How much does Jesus value us? Well, he tells us that whoever he Acknowledge, he will acknowledge. He values us just as much as he values himself. <clears throat> so how does that help us when our families are being divided because of the word of truth? Because we have the spirit of God and they can't, they can't deal with that. They can't deal with us being who God created us to be, and who God is calling us to be, because those are one and the same. All I know is that if we keep focusing on service, if we keep focusing on helping those who are in need and turning towards righteousness, turning towards godliness, and turning towards that spirit of prophecy, where if I read the scripture and I say, God, I don't understand this today, but I pray that I will understand it. That as we turn to these things, God transforms our lives and people see that in us. And it forces them to see, is this really the work of the devil? Or is this God moving? In Acts chapter 2, Peter sees that all these people who have gathered for Pentecost have received the Holy Spirit. And he had received a dream later on that God had made clean all of those who he called. And he couldn't deal with that. He couldn't deal with the idea that these Gentiles who had been unclean had been made clean by God. See, his theology had to grow in order to deal with what God was doing. God called people who Peter considered unrighteous, immoral, uncircumcised, unclean. God called them to be his people Peter had to expand his theology accordingly. And that is exactly what we have to do. I know that it's hard to say 
How far do we go with unmerited grace? Who is my neighbor? It's even harder knowing that there are churches that say, you're not my neighbor. Especially with me. I have to do that on a pretty regular basis. Planting a church that's open and affirming, welcoming of gay people, and saying that we are all God's children, no matter who you are. That's a difficult thing, and it brings the kind of attention where you won't have peace day by day. It's the kind of attention that makes you a target. But are you still willing to live for God? Are you still willing to live a righteous life, to live the life of, well, as Jesus puts it, a prophet? Are you still willing to acknowledge Jesus before others, even though they say, that's the work of the devil. I can't see Jesus in you. But that's what it takes to be a Christian. It's sacrifice. But it's the kind of sacrifice that changes lives. The kind that takes people who say, I can't see your humanity and turns them into people that cannot help but help their neighbors, no matter what their neighbor looks like, no matter how they see them. So, if you haven't experienced that change in your life, then I pray that you feel moved, To, to make that commitment, to take that next step. You know, that any day you can be baptized, you can say, today is the day that I'm going to renew my life. I'm going to be reborn. I'm going to acknowledge Jesus to the world. And I'm going to be saved not just for my sake, but because there are a lot of sparrows out there and some of them are falling away. And they need to see that in someone's life. If God exists, then God is here. And if God is here, then God is moving through us. And that is the only way that miracles happen. So, let's think about this as we pray. Father God, we thank you for moving in our lives, for bringing us your word of truth, for moving through us and in us, and for transforming us day by day so that people who today see us as sons of the devil, who today see us as something other than human, can realize that the righteousness in our lives, the change, the sanctification that you bring only comes from you, Lord. We pray that we shine with your light, that the world may know that you are God, that you are the one who saves, and that it is by no other power, by no other name, and that if they believe that righteousness comes by any other means, that they can look to us and say, but, but how? Lord, we pray that we always extend your definition of mercy. As you said, as we forgive, may we be forgiven. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.